What happened? What happened? Where are we? I have no idea, but it's dark and I am getting the heck out of here. Let's go this way. Stay where you are! Uh, who said that? Who's there? I am Dalek Sek, leader of the cult of Skaro. What? What? I don't even know what that tin can just said, let alone what he means. Or she means. The Daleks have genders? Uh, never mind that. How did we even get here? Emergency temporal shift! Ah, great. Just what we need. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. Oh, I've got a bad feeling about this. We have got to get out of here. You may not leave my presence! This guy is crazy town banana pants if he thinks we're staying here. What's your bad feeling telling you? Well, think about it. What do Daleks like to do? Um... Exterminate? Exterminate! Exterminate! We need to get out of here. Well, wait, wait, what's that? I'm the doctor. What? Doctor Who? Uh, never mind that. How do we get out of this? Basically, run. Welcome to Communicore Weekly, I'm George. And I'm Jeff, and this is the timey-wimey, spacey wavey episode of Communicore Weekly. It's our tribute to time travel and Disney's look at the future, so we really hope you guys enjoy it. We really don't do a lot of themed episodes, I think we've done like one, maybe two before, but we think this will be a good one. Well, are we allowed to use timey-wimey? Isn't that copyrighted? Is it copyrighted? I don't think it's copyrighted. I don't know, I'd hate to have for somebody to... Contact well, us, if, if, us. It, if it's copyrighted, we'll just go back in time and say get out of the episode. Oh. So if they're hearing this, that means it's okay. But if we're saying something else... Well, that's true, because we would have gone back and changed what we were going to say. Right, right, exactly. Like, I oh. would come back and I would stop myself from saying that. I'd be like, hey, so you'd hear another me. No, like a they'd have to me. send me back, because if you go back, that's like a time parallax or slee stacks or something like that. Yeah, but then you would hear yourself over me oh, also yeah. so that's still uh, i'm my i'm good let's just do the history it's time for disney history so we thought the timekeeper would be a perfect fit for our timey wimey show because it obviously deals with something that we love and that is time travel so while you don't go back in time in the show to make sure that your parents kissed during the Enchantment of the Sea dance, you- Ooh, that's gross. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to see that anyway, but I mean, if you were trying to help your own existence to happen, then obviously it has to be done, but- Good point, good yeah, point. Yeah, the, the Timekeeper helped, you know, you got to visit plenty of places during uh, history. Um, it was called the Timekeeper in the Magic Kingdom when it opened in 1994, but it was originally known as, uh, here's, my, here's my French coming into play, La Visionarium, Ooh. Right? Ooh, yeah. Nice. Love Visionarium, when it opened in Euro Disney in 1992, it was also called Un Voyage à Travers de Tom. Ooh, nailed it. Yeah. Pretty right? good. Pretty good. Pretty good. And that was the actual name of the film at Euro Disney. Um, it was also the first Circle Vision 360 film that was arranged with an actual plot, because the ones before that were just uh, pictures of landscapes. I mean, th those were cool, they were pretty, but they didn't have a real plot. Uh, it was also the first Circle Vision show to use audio animatronics in the form of uh, everybody's favorite robotic scientist, the Timekeeper. Yes, much better than everybody's favorite alien. Who, who's everyone's favorite alien? Stitch. Oh, right. 
Yeah. Well, Forget let's that. move on. Anyways, because of the uh, more interesting nature of the narrative storyline, they needed a new concept in order to explain why you were standing inside a circular theater, for lack of a better word. <laughs> so the character of Nine Eyes was the, the one they created by the timekeeper. She has cameras all around her, so she can film in 360 degrees at once and, of course, send the images back to us. Of course, this was before the Magic Kingdom had Wi-Fi, so it must have been like a T1 Ooh, or a fiber. A fiber. Who knows? Probably. The, uh, the attraction was known with various names throughout its incarnation in the parks. At Walt Disney World, guests would visit the Transportarium to experience this trip through time, and it was later named the Tomorrowland Metropolis Science Center to better fit the Tomorrowland makeover. Now, one of the original concepts for the film included Jules Verne, and he was going to visit the past and present of uh, Europe and their history, and he was going to discover some new things along the way, but he was also going to use the time machine of his good friend H.G. Wells, because let's face it, it only makes sense that the two of them were besties, right? Yep, good point. See? It would, they were like us, but in the past. So we're in the future? Again, my my nose is going to bleed from this time travel talk, so I'm just going to ignore it for Gosh. now. Okay. They also had another concept that dealt with a child that was going to explore the story of European history and European scientists on like a, a super time traveling computer, but that really didn't make a lot of sense, and that was part of the reason they let that go. It was too unfocused, so they kind of concentrated on the less plot heavy idea of the timekeeper and Nine Eyes exploring the past, but they also took Jules Verne uh, a bit of that concept and put it into this ride as well. Yeah, you always got to have something funny happening. Um, the film first showed up at Discoveryland, uh, showed up, premiered, nice choice of words there, at uh, Euro Disney on April 12th, 1992. Then CEO Michael Eisner, another reason we use our time machine, uh, called it the showcase attraction of the land at the time. Uh, however, a lot of the critics didn't agree and thought it was kind of lackluster. You know, uh, A similar version opened up almost a year later in April 1993 at Tokyo Disneyland as part of that park's 10th anniversary celebration. Now, the, the attraction was originally going to make its U.S. debut as part of Discoveryland USA, which was an expansion proposal for the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World. Um, but there was a lot of financial difficulties that arose because of the Euro Disney project, so Discoveryland was cancelled for Walt Disney World. Mm. Yeah, it would have been really cool, I think, yep. but, I mean, what are we going to do? We, we can't go back and change the past. Or can we? Mm. Mm. But it was still decided that the ride was going to make its Magic Kingdom debut, so they kind of stuck it into the new Tomorrowland makeover. And uh, at one point, the, the attraction was also going to have a restaurant that was going to be <laughs> themed to it as well. Yeah. I'm not sure. It sounds... Well, <laughs> it, it, the Plaza Pavilion was going to receive a makeover, and they were going to call it the Astronomer's Club, sort of like the Adventurer's Club. See what they did over there? At downtown Disney Pleasure Island. Yeah, that was that was pretty good. Uh, but instead, it would feature you know, famed scientists such as Da Vinci, Isaac Newton, and Galileo, who would appear in the restaurant and then be called back to the past by the timekeeper. Of course, the almighty dollar spoke, and it was a little too costly. So the timekeeper opened on November 21st, 1994, as part of the new Tomorrowland expansion. The timekeeper was voiced by Robin Williams for this incarnation, while Nine Eye was voiced by Rhea Perlman. And I always remember the first time I went to the ride, and Robin Williams' voice came out of the timekeeper, and I was like, <laughs> oh my god, it's Robin Williams. The dude from Jumanji is going to send me through time. Whereas I thought it was... Mork from Orc, but I guess that really dates. Never mind, moving on. See, but I used to watch that show too, but fits into our theme because it has to do with space, so that's okay. But That's good. Uh, because of, there was really low attendance for it, so it was moved to the seasonal list of attractions in 2001. Boo. And, yeah, which is upsetting because I did enjoy the ride. But mm -hmm. also, after 9 11, um, they were in a tough spot because there's a part of the film where they fly over New York City and they, they, mm -hmm. you can see the Twin Towers in the skyline, so there was a a thing that tells you what time period you're in when you walk into the room, so they sent it permanently to the year 2000 so as not to offend anyone's sensibilities. Um, it actually closed in February 2006 to make way for the Monsters Incorporated Laugh Floor, but a lot of the infrastructure for the Circle Vision Theater is still there, so if they want to bring something like that back, they totally can, but I doubt they will, so we'll just have to go back in time to enjoy it. Well, you know, if I was those monsters from the Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor, I'd be pretty scared because, you know, any minute their job could be gone. 
He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a, geek. He's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. You know, Jeff, for the special timey-wimey episode, I wanted to do the Book of the Week. Released in 1957, the book Our Friend the Atom was a companion piece to that film, Our Friend the Atom. You know, good thing they had the same name. Many baby boomers will remember the film since it was a staple in most public schools up until probably the mid-1980s. Um, Walt was always interested in technology and how it could work, how it could be used to make our everyday lives better. The world's first nuclear submarine had debuted a few years, few years earlier. The space race was about to start and all the world was looking out into space and into space to try to figure things out. And really, the book couldn't have come at a more opportune time. We were still discovering so much about our world and expected nuclear power to change everything that we did. Looking at the book, what surprised me first was the list of artists that contributed to the book. John Hench, Claude Coates, Paul Hartley, and Colin Campbell are some of the more familiar names. Dr. Hans Haber wrote a majority of the book, along with some studio writers. Dr. Haber was employed by UCLA and was a chief scientific consultant to the Walt Disney Studios for the book, the film, and many of the space-related films of the studios. This book is a great look at a time when the country was still looking forward to technology and the simple and easy future. But the atom was still a little scary and unknown. The book does a great job of tracing the history and surprisingly would need a little, little update in some areas to remain current. The first section is historical. The illustrations do a great job of sort of capturing the style of the art uh, for the historical period. And you know, like when we, reached, when we reached the 1800s, the illustrations developed more of a tin type look. So the artists were aware of sort of what they were doing. But of course, the majority of the book talks about you know, what was known about atoms and atomic energy at the time. There are some wonderful illustrations that help tell the story and relate the information. The ideas are pretty straightforward, but we have obviously surpassed them in many aspects. Most people will really enjoy this book for its retro futurism and kitschy artwork. It sort of reminded me of the scene at the uh, end of Spaceship Earth by Siemens, when you choose your future. When you choose your future, yeah. Same type of artwork. Uh, for those who grew up reading this book in the 60s and 70s, it will be a great trip down memory lane. And another uh, interesting fact, General Dynamics helped fund the book and the submarine voyage at Disneyland. And they also made nuclear reactors. What about flux capacitors? <laughs> Great Scott. <laughs> we got to get this show up to eight. <laughs> 88 viewers, please, before we can go back to the future. Are we allowed to cross streams like that? Well, that's a whole nother show. Sometimes it's a one. Sometimes it's a two. When you got to go, what you're going to do? It's a bathroom break. A bathroom break. <laughs> The Bathroom of Tomorrow. Land. Oh, was I supposed to go? Sorry, I was expecting that intro to be a little bit uh, bigger. You know, I wasn't sure. Well, if you find yourself in Tomorrowland and uh, find yourself at Cosmic Ray's Starlight Cafe, go down the hallway behind the kitchen, connects both sides of the dining room, and they have some, some pretty nice bathrooms back there. Yeah, and I mean, they are pretty nice. And not only do they cater to humanoids, but according to the image on their sign, robots are also welcome to leak their oil as well. Huh? Huh? You see not what I did there? bad. Not too bad. I guess we'll hear from our future selves if that was worth it. Yeah, if this was a bad joke, that joke will not be in the episode. But if That's it's a true. good joke, it's staying. This is a great way to get all of these episodes done. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. <laughs> you know, one of the most memorable lines you hear as you take a ride on the people mover in the Magic Kingdom is, uh, Paging Mr. Morrow, Mr. Tom Morrow. You know, and that used to be played as you pass the Carousel of Progress, but now the newer version, where because you know they took it out for a while, but they put it back in because people complain. But now, now it plays when you enter Space Mountain. Well, yeah, you can also hear uh, the same line in Star Tours 1.0. Uh, well, you could, not any longer, I guess. Until well, because we, it's time travel, time you travel. could still hear it if you went back to 1.0, but now you can't. Okay. Oh gosh, my headache. Um, 
Well, you know, but while you were waiting to board your flight, is when you would hear it. Uh, it, it. This is in reference to the old Walt Disney World attraction, Flight to the Moon, which is now occupied by Stitch's Great Escape. Tom Morrow was the audio animatronic host of the pre-show of that ride. Well, George, now it's time to pick our fan of the week for our timey-wimey, spacey wacy episode of Communicor Weekly, so why don't you help me out with that one? Hey, Jeff, Jeff, this is George from the future. I wanted to bring you this special hologram envelope that has our fan of the week for this week. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know what I'm more weirded out by, that it's George from the future that is handing it to me, or that you somehow booped into existence with that noise. That was kind of bizarre. But where, where's where's the present, George? Oh, I'm still here. I'm, I'm, I'm at my home and my computer. I just, I didn't freak out because I knew future George came back and told me that he was going to do this, so I was, like, fine with it. But if Future George came back and told you that he was going to do this, doesn't that somehow negate the timeline? Because you're not supposed to interact with your yourself. Oh, he sent me a text from my future phone, iPhone 19, that I had. Well, that's weird. Isn't it the same phone number? Um, it's... George from the future, help me out with this. Y yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's from the future. Ooh, spooky magic from the future. So we should probably just pick the fan of the week now, right? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, me too. I think we both. That makes three of us picking the fan of the week. This has got really, really bizarre really quick, and I don't know what's going on anymore. Okay, well, here's the envelope. Open it up, and I'm going to uh, head back to Disney World, which is where I live now inside the castle. <laughs> Bloop. Okay, again, the blooping, I don't know what kind of future technology is going on, but we really need to figure that out because there needs to be a better sound effect in the bloop for the time travel. That's really bizarre to me for some reason. Yeah, anyway. I thought it was strange the first time I heard it too. It, 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 it's much louder uh, in person than I think it comes across, you know, through the podcast, <laughs> I think. So as I'm opening this, this hologram envelope, uh, the, the fan of the week is Crystal West, who is a fan of the show, very, and she's definitely a big Communicore Weekly geek, so thank you, Crystal West, for watching the show. We really appreciate it. Yay! Yay! That's awesome. Awesome. But we love everybody, so thank you to everyone for watching the show. We, we all really appreciate it. Yes, we do. And, and, you know, tell us what you think. Leave us a comment there on YouTube if you're watching it or on iTunes. And if you're listening to this from the future, which is really kind of awesome, send us like a hologram text message from your iPhone 19 or something like that, because I've seen it there. Cool. Yeah, we probably won't be able to read it yet for another couple of years, oh. but just send it to us anyway. That'd be cool. Yeah, well, we should get it eventually. But if you're if you're using, you know, present day stuff, then you can email us at communicorweekly yeah. at gmail.com. And, like, let us know if you enjoyed this episode or other things you want us to cover in the future. In the future! <laughs> I wonder if there's still Twitter in the future. There might be. Maybe there it's, might be. it's instantaneous. It's instantaneous. goes right to your brain. But, you know, follow me. I'm Imaginerding, at Imaginerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And there. Also like us on Facebook at facebook.com yes. slash Communicore Weekly. And whatever our future Facebook places are too. Yes. Like like us on everything. I'm George. I'm the Doctor. And I'm Jeff. And we're all from a mice chat, apparently. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly. Davos.